Hello and welcome to the New Lines podcast. I'm Lydia Wilson and this is a podcast where we delve into some of the biggest ideas, events and personalities in the Middle East and beyond. Today I'm talking to award-winning journalist and author Janine De Giovanni, who has for the past three decades covered conflicts, including the first Palestinian Intifada in the early 1990s, the siege of Sarajevo, the Rwandan genocide, the wars in Sierra Leone, Somalia, Afghanistan and many others. She reported extensively from Iraq pre and post invasion and on the Arab Spring, including the Syrian conflict, which was the subject of a previous book. Janine's most recent book is called The Vanishing, The Twilight of Christianity in the Middle East. And this is what we will be discussing today. Hello, Janine, and welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you so much for having me here. You open your book by talking about your own relationship with Christianity, and you frame the whole book in how your faith and childhood prayers and rituals have comforted you during the pandemic, and indeed at other times of danger in your decades of reporting from war zones. I wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that as the motivation for writing about Christians in the Middle East. It was very interesting. I did not set out to do that. Um, I've been working in the Middle East for, for three decades, and I've always been fascinated by minorities, uh, whether it be Yazidis or, or Christians or Samaritans in the West Bank. And when I decided after I, I wrote a book about the war in Syria, which was published in 2016, and after that, I felt like I really wanted to dive deeper into Christian minorities in Iraq, Syria, Gaza and Egypt because I felt these were the four places where they were the most vulnerable, the most at risk. So I began doing my research in 2016, and I had finished it by 2020. So I had done all my field work, my interviews, my reading, and then the hard part of sitting down at my desk and beginning to do the writing, which usually takes me about a year, a year and a half, once the research is done. And the pandemic hit, and I had taken my young son, who is French, from New York back to Paris to see his father for spring break on March 13th, 2020. And literally the next day, President Macron got on TV and said, nous sommes en guerre, we're at war. The borders closed. And I was in France for the next six months, which was not a hardship other than the pandemic, because I went to a very remote village in the Alps where my my ex-husband's ancestors have lived for 400 years, very remote, not at all chic, but absolutely safe. And I was living with French cousins who were extremely devout Catholics. So I think in times of great fear, uncertainty, darkness, transition, people turn to faith, whether it's Christianity, Islam, Judaism, if you, if you are a believer, that is, um, it's something you, you find within you, in my case, from my childhood and something that I had actually all my life when I was in places where I was deeply frightened, um, the siege of Sarajevo, for instance, or all over Africa, where I lived for many years during wartime, I would seek out churches um, because I felt when I was there that I wasn't alone. So that's the kind of personal side of the book, which was never meant to be. It just, it kind of crept into it because of circumstances and because of COVID. Right, right. And it sounds like quite a good writing retreat in a way. <laughs> um, but you say you did the research from 2016 to 2020, but how much do you think all your past decades have informed what's in The Vanishing? Oh, absolutely, Lydia. It was so vital. I'm when I first started working in the Middle East during the first Intifada, I was completely green and I had studied comparative literature. I wasn't an Arabist. And when I arrived, um, the, the Middle East correspondents at that point were much, much older than me, um, very skilled. They had all covered the civil war in Lebanon and had been in Iraq for decades. So I was really out of my depth. And I remember a very kind of mean spirited, older Italian woman journalist saying to me, how do you think you can actually ever understand the Middle East? And um, when I like, it was so mean, but within, 
within nine months there, I had landed a book contract and it was to write about the occupation, the Israeli occupation from both the perspective of Palestinians and Israelis. And of course, you know, in, in retrospect, it seems absurd, you know, a woman in her twenties with no background, but it, it, you know, when you've got to get up to, up to scratch very quickly, I did. But the decades that I've spent since then reporting have kind of layered me. Like, so I have a multi, it's almost like layering of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so writing about the Christians, for instance, I kept referring back to the time of Saddam Hussein or, um, you know, writing about Egypt during the Mubarak years. I could, I had a kind of reference point of working within periods before the Arab Spring. And I think for me, that was really vital. I, and also <laughs> the wonderful thing about getting older is you feel more confident. You feel more confident in your writing, in your reporting, in your knowledge, in your ability you know, to hold a conversation in a room. When I was 25 at the American colony in Jerusalem, surrounded by these hard battled veteran male Middle East reporters, I, I barely opened my mouth because I was so terrified. Um, and, you know, now I'm old and wiser, so I can I feel that I do have some authority um, and, and knowledge of the region. Right. So coming back to the vanishing specifically, was there a particular incident that that sparked your concerns about the, the, the Christians in the Middle East? What, what made you start to genuinely worry about their future? There were two. The first one, I'd say, was right before the invasion, the American invasion in Iraq um, back in 2003. And in those days, it was very, very difficult to get permission to travel, difficult to get into Iraq to get a visa under Saddam's regime, but extremely difficult to leave Baghdad um, because, of course, you, you had the Muqabarat following you. And if you traveled, they were wary that you'd, you'd go off, off, off narrative. Um, you know, they really kept strict hold control of you. But I managed to get to Mosul and to Nineveh. And I remember going to mass literally weeks before the invasion and how terrified the Christian the Christians were. It was an Assyrian church and they were praying in Aramaic and the language of Jesus Christ. So I, I can't even begin to tell you how unbelievably moving and also haunting it was because they were foreseeing the end of their 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 civilization you know they've been in that part of the world for 2000 years they're descendants of the prophets so they had always felt protected in some way under saddam as as often christian minorities in the middle east do feel sheltered by by dictators and suddenly there was this unknown force coming and they thought for them it was the end of days. So that really struck me. And then the other thing that struck me was in 2016, again in Northern Iraq at a monastery called Mar Matai, which is built into a mountain. And it was right after the fall of ISIS or maybe ISIS was not yet completely defeated, but I had been there, I'd been in Iraq in 2014 when ISIS rolled through Mosul. So this was the moment when it became clear that they were going to be defeated. Um, and there was a gathering at Mar Matai of, of Christians who lived in the area and some who had actually sheltered there throughout the two years of ISIS's reign. And they were celebrating um, and everyone brought food and they were praying and they were dancing and they were, um, I can't say it was happy because they had gone through such unbearable trauma during the ISIS years. They'd been displaced from their homes. Their churches had been destroyed. Their crucifixes had been ripped down and trampled upon. And, and their deep fear, the trauma that they had lived through was, was really evident. So it wasn't happy. But what it was, one told me, and I, I'll never forget it, it was a celebration of life. So those two moments, but there's many. I mean, I could tell you about being in monasteries in Egypt where I felt profoundly moved or working in Gaza, which always for me is um, incredibly emotional. 
Um, I love Gaza very much. I'm very attached to it. It was my first big reporting story. And now I find myself interviewing children of the Shabab that I interviewed way back in the first or even second intifada. So, um, yeah, many, many poignant moments for me mm. reporting and writing this book. Well, I'd like to pick up on those two major ones that you mentioned, both in Iraq. I mean, when you mentioned the deep fear in 2003, that actually reminds me of a documentary called Iraq, My Homeland. I'm not sure if you saw it. It was six hours and the majority of it was actually about those pre-invasion weeks. It was it was two or three weeks, I think, um, of observing one big extended family preparing. And they were actually Muslim. And um, they were in Baghdad and doing things like getting food in. But the, the way that um, you speak about the, the, the congregation um, reminds me of that. They felt that there was an apocalyptic fight coming. They feared for the future of their families and their way of life and their community as well. Um, and also um, in terms of the fall of ISIS, talking about your second reason in, in 2016, I would say that most Muslims across the region, uh, certainly in Iraq, but also everywhere, they were really delighted that, 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 that the group was about to be defeated as well. You know, you, you talk about a celebration of life. I think ISIS had that, that, that reputation of, of, of a death cult for, for Muslims as well. So can you explain a little bit more about the specific reasons that, that, that Christians might be worried? Yeah, well, look, there's... You know, again, many people said to me, why did you choose these four countries and why not Lebanon, which, of course, has, you know, a sizable Christian community. For me, I felt Lebanon, just as an off thing, was the Christians were are deeply embedded into society, the economic, social, political life. So I felt that they weren't in the same vulnerable positions, the Iraqi, Syrian, Gazan and Egyptian Christians are. So there is a common theme for all of them. And then each one of them has specific challenges, which are, you know, specific to their country, their region, their, their society. All of them are threatened by radicalization. So one thing that I was so careful when I was writing this, I was really cautious that I did not fall into the trap which the right-wing American Trumpists, um, evangelical, and the, the set right-wing settler movement in Israel would want me to write, which is that Christians and Muslims cannot live together because of this evil, radical uh, Islam. Hmm. I so didn't want to do that, and I was so cautious of it because I don't believe that. I do believe Islam and Christianity are compatible, and I do believe that they've lived together for thousands and thousands of years. But there has been... You know, indeed, since the time I started working in the first intifada, since the second intifada, um, a rise of radical groups. And those also include Jewish groups, Christian groups, and, you know, but mainly um, in terms for the Christians, what they feared was ISIS, Daesh. But they also fear now Iranian-backed militias. They also fear Turkish airstrikes. So, you know... Iraq, I think, is a very specific situation because they're extremely vulnerable and they were probably hit the hardest, the Iraqi and Syrian Christians, by ISIS. Syria has a different issue, which is the geopolitics of the brutal war, which is now entering its 12th year. Mm -hmm. So 12 years of war is a horrifically long time. I lived through the siege of Sarajevo. It was three years and it seemed like a lifetime. 12 years is the span of a child being born and becoming nearly a teenager. So these people have endured horrific levels of, of inhumanity. Um, so the Christians there are, of course, affected by that. They also fear, many of them feel, feel protected by Bashar. So there's that. Gaza, of course, the 800 Christians there are suffering the same misery that the two million other Muslims are as well, which is the the wrath and the reign of the Israel occupation and the siege imposed by um, Gaza and Israel. 
um, which is horrific. The bombing in, I just, I was in Gaza in August. Um, the bombing in May, the 11 day bombing, which was horrible, um, just even punctured the infrastructure more than it already had. The electricity cuts, the lack of fresh water, the 80% unemployment amongst an extremely intelligent and highly educated population is heartbreaking. Um, and they've got Hamas. So that's Gaza. Um, Egypt, of course, there are laws embedded into the constitution which directly discriminate against Christians. They cannot hold high ranking office in government or the military. And then all of them face a common theme, which is also everyone faces climate change. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Middle East is warming twice as fast as anywhere else. Um, the great rivers, the Nile, the Tigris, the Euphrates, the livelihood along these rivers are endangered. The Christian farmers in Nineveh, their farms, ISIS, when they went through, they destroyed the irrigation pipes. Um, and in some cases, they destroyed the, the farms themselves, the silos of wheat. Um, so, you know, all of these factors in addition to migration. So their biggest enemy is migration. Um, how do they keep young people there when there are no jobs, no economic incentive? So Iraq, for instance, we've gone from the census 40 years ago during Saddam time of what we think is 1.5 million Christians to something like 100,000. And that's probably highballing it. Um, and I've been told within 100 years that there won't be Christians in Iraq anymore. And then I was corrected by someone who said, no, it's more like 40 years. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's certainly a lot to pick up on from all of those, all, everything that everything you mentioned. Um, so let me try and unpick it a little okay. bit. <laughs> uh, I mean, firstly, again, I, I would say, as, as you were talking, I was thinking about the radical groups or climate change or ISIS burning fields, which, which they did as a weapon of war and retribution. And as for migration, you know, a lot of the reasons for migration are, are actually economic and to do with lack of jobs or, or structural corruption or instability and violence. But all of these factors are applicable to the whole population of the Middle East. It's not Christian yes. specific. It's, would you say that was right? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Although I do think on top of that, then for the Christians, you do have this vulnerability of being persecuted and discriminated for, for 2000 years. So, I mean, I do think all of those things, and I, and I, for a moment, I don't want to, especially in Gaza, you know, where the situation is so um, inhumane and, you know, it is everyone that is suffering. But I think for Christians, there's a, a, another added dimension, which is that vulnerability. And, and the fact that they do feel, I mean, look at the Jewish community of, is, of Iraq. Um, who were, you know, so vibrant and such an important part of Iraqi society, they were all but gone by the 70s, disappeared. But so that, that's I mean, fear. Uh, yeah, but that that involved Israel being established. That wasn't persecution out, out of nowhere, was it? That was a Jewish country in the region being established in 1948. Yes, but if you look at it from purely from... A, a demographic and the the mosaic of Iraq. These, I mean, I feel like these minorities are, are crucial. Well, to any to any culture, right? To Britain, to the U.S. Um, minorities make up the the great mosaic of a country of the the social, the political, the economic life. And I think the Christians post ISIS. I really do feel in the way that we've all been scarred by the pandemic. It's been very traumatic for us. That's the sense of trauma I feel they feel, this kind of underlying fear, because someone did come to eradicate them, and that was ISIS. And they, they came to Mosul, and as you know, they, they painted the N over their doors of the ones who stayed, the ones who didn't, got in their cars, took their documents, took their pets, took their kids, and fled. And some of them have never been able to go back. Mm -hmm. um, that, that kind of trauma, I think, lasts for a, a really long time. Um, and I know that because I work, I've worked with refugees my entire career and 
Um, when people flee somewhere and are displaced, even if they do get to go back, which is pretty rare, there's always this very deep underlying transgenerational trauma, which stays for a very long time. Absolutely. So, I, so yeah. I do think I do think they they have an added dimension of of fear and insecurity. Well, that is certainly the feeling that ISIS and COVID brought to the region, I would say, definitely, and that, that trauma is real. And also the trauma, as you've already described, in Gaza, the trauma of regular violence, but also everyday difficulties, economic difficulties, violence, and, and uh, I, yeah, the, the occupation, the daily occupation. Um, but I'd like to actually um, explore a bit more about Palestine as a whole. I hope we yes. can talk a bit about Jerusalem and the West Bank, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, you, your book focuses mostly on Gaza, but the yeah. Christians of the occupied territories have also faced really very severe repression. There's a separation wall around Bethlehem itself, and we have Banksy's uh, hotel stuck in the middle, only half a building. Yes. Yes. Um, and I wondered if you could talk a bit about that. Yes, oh, absolutely. Um, look, I the working in Palestine for thirty years has been, you know, a great for me sorrow um, and indignation. I've gone through so many stages. I can't tell you. Starting my, I mean, my first big story was was Israel Palestine, and the reason I never wanted to be a journalist. I became a journalist because I met a human rights lawyer. Um, called Felicia Langer, a Jewish lawyer, Holocaust survivor, who was defending Palestinians in military court during the first Intifada. I knew nothing about what was happening there. I knew, you know, I knew there was an uprising, but I met her and she basically connected me to all of the activists at that time in the West Bank and Gaza. And once I walked through that door, I could never again walk back. I, I mean, I wanted to get a PhD and be an academic in comparative literature. I had nothing to do with the Middle East. I was studying Russian literature. Um, and I, from that moment on, I was driven by this vast sense of injustice. And I mean, today, Sheikh Jarrah, you know, I was the first yeah. thing I opened the news to see what was happening there. Um, it's gotten worse. I mean, I, my last trip to Gaza, um, I, I can't help but reflect back on standing on the beach I think right after the Oslo Accords were signed in, in 1994, and Oslo was so flawed, um, but there was a hope, there was a kind of hope that, you know, Arafat was going back to Gaza, um, there were, the airport was opening up, there was talks about the port of Gaza, um, businesses, there was going to be freedom of movement, and then it all, the second intifada, then the, the closures in Gaza, the election of Hamas, the punitive collective punishment, the cruelty of it, the cruelty of it is, you know, it's it's kind of gotten me to a point where I went through all these stages of anger and frustration and rage. And there was one point actually where I just, I just thought I'm not working there for a couple of years because I can't bear it. And I was actually offered a job um, in Palestine at one point in my career and a very good friend of mine took me aside and said, I don't want you to take this because I know how it will affect you. You'll be angry all the time. And coming back from Gaza this trip, I walked through Erez and I, I've never felt so hopeless for it because here's the thing. And I actually just have a big article coming out of Vanity Fair um, this week. Um, and I'm really proud of the editor of Vanity Fair to have the courage to let me write about Gaza, very difficult in America to bring up, um, very different in Britain where there's much more open-mindedness and support of, um, of lifting the, the restrictions in Palestine, the occupation here, you have to be extremely careful or you get attacked and you get labeled. Um, but I came out of Gaza and I just, I, I, I remember going back to my room, waiting for my flight and crying because I just felt like the people I left behind have the most extraordinary potential, especially the young people. They're linguists. You know, as you know, they, they all speak really good English and some of them speak two or three European languages they learned on YouTube because mm -hmm. they've never been out of Gaza. And yet 
we keep this yoke of oppression on them. Can you imagine what they would do if this was lifted? The potential in Gaza? I mean, I have a dream, which is to turn it into a Chennai. Um, why is outsourcing all done in India or the Philippines? Why can't we have outsourcing in Gaza? Why can't we have more small businesses? Why can't we support entrepreneurial spirit there? Um, the Israelis won't let us, of course, but it, it, the, I think if we could harness the absolute energy, intellect, potential of this generation of Gazans, they could, they could move mountains. And I think we have to encourage this. Well, it's difficult politically, isn't it? Yeah. But I, I wondered if I could just bring you back to the West Bank, which, yes. of course, is suffering hugely as well um, under the occupation. Um, but they're in a bit of a different situation, aren't they? Are they, act they actually... OK, so as your listeners will know, the Israeli soldiers pulled out of Gaza, um, but psychologically, they are very much still there with the threat of the bombings. So I still refer to it as an occupation. Um, the West Bank Christians, of course, are really um, in the middle of it in the sense that they have the encroaching settlements um, and they live every day with the checkpoints, the humiliation of yeah. going through a checkpoint. Um, in Bethlehem, as you said, the wall goes right through it. Now, what that wall meant when it went up, and I remember going there and going to olive farms and families, literally, the wall sometimes went through, you know, families' properties and, yes. and separated families. Um, you know, we again, we don't know how many Christians live in the West Bank in Jerusalem, but we, I think it's about 50,000. Um, and there's there's only 800 in, in, in Gaza. Um, and they... I mean, they want to leave. And the reason why I'm really wary to, um, to talk about the, their desperation to leave is because they have to stay. If, you know, and this is easy for me to say because I have freedom of movement. I don't have to go through checkpoints. I don't have the Israeli occupation. But if they leave, um, they're, I mean, it's gone from something like, 84% um, in Bethlehem to 22% Christian. Um, so if we, you, you, this kind of steep decline, and also in Bet Jala, um, another city but, in the West Bank, um, Bet Sahur, I mean, the, the numbers are just absolutely dropping. So, but sorry. What was, sorry, what, we can't really talk about that demographic change, can we, without mentioning 1948 and the creation yeah. of Israel. It's not just, say, a differing birth rate or migration. There's, there's fundamental political acts that have changed the, the demographics. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. When the, Ottomans, when the Ottoman era ended, there was 11% Christians. Um, now it's... I don't know, barely 1%. So, I mean, while I would say that the the creation of, if you're going to talk about the creation of, of Israel in 1948, you have to look at the expulsion, um, you know, which today and, and Israel, you know, the right-wing Israelis don't call it an expulsion. They call it the birth of their nation. So absolutely. I mean, this is, this is at the forefront of it, but how... Mm -hmm. This isn't going to be reversed, right? So what we have to look at now, what can we do to protect these people? That, that's primarily what I try to look at. Um, they're here, and I wrote The Vanishing for a very specific reason. I want it to be a document that lasts so that, I mean, really all my work, all, everything I do, I try to do a sort of oral history so that there can never be any claims um, that this didn't happen. So I think it's, I think looking back at the creation of Israel doesn't really help us. I think what does, what we have to do is continue to advocate for, for rights, for policies to be put in place to protect them. Um, and, and I mean, more importantly, and it's very pragmatic and, and, and hard nosed, but I mean, it has to be economic incentives for, the, for them to stay. Pressuring the Israeli government, as you know, 
does nothing. Look at the bombing. Mm. In I mean, there was a worldwide indignation for the first time. American congressmen and women stood up against it. That has never happened in my memory. Mm. Did it stop them from killing more than 260 people? No. So we're not going to reverse their 1948 expulsion. But what can we do now to protect these people? I think that's that's really the question. Well, we'll hopefully we'll have time to come back to the question of, of, of solutions. Um, but I just wanted to pick up on something that you've already mentioned. And that's another country that's not in, in the book, and that's Lebanon, right? Lebanon was created as a Christian state. And although shifting demographics have taken away that, that majority status that they had at the beginning, they still wield a lot of political and financial power, far more than, say, the Coptic community that you profiled. But as with all the four countries you did cover, there is currently a mass exodus from the country, particularly amongst the youth. And this sort of complicates the issue, doesn't it? I'm interested in how it fits into your thesis. You know, the day um, ISIS took over Mosul, I was in Baghdad. And the first thing I did was go drive to see the Chaldean uh, bishop in Baghdad. And I, I asked him, um, what, what are you telling people? Because they were, you know, they were frantically calling him. And he was in turmoil because... Um, how could he tell them not to leave? At, but at the same time, you know, his role as their as their shepherd in, in you know is to tell them to stay. Because if they leave their ancestral lands, if migration, I mean, migration really is their enemy. Um it's uh, corruption, as you pointed out, absolutely systemic corruption is part of it. Um, but but the big the big issue is them leaving. Now if you think back to 2016, when Trump initiated his Muslim ban here, it did not include Christians. So I was really concerned, and I was working for the UN Refugee Agency at the time, that this was going to send a very strong message that we have two kinds of refugees. Good refugees, Christians. Bad refugees, Muslims. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't let Muslims into the country, but you could let Christians. So that kind of encouraged... Um, more migration to Canada, to the U.S., and they always want to go to Scandinavia and Germany. Um, and I think that, you know, very easy for me to say, right? I have freedom to worship. I'm not in Egypt, in Minya, being, you know, prevented from going to church. I'm not in a village where literally the only church in town, there's a, a, a huge lock on it. And if you go, you might be in danger of having it lit on fire while you're there. I'm not prevented from holding a position in government because I'm Christian. And I don't fear for my life that a radical group is going to come again and wipe out my entire village or, you know, displace my family. So very easy for me to sit here in the comfort of my home in New York City and speak like this. And I'm really aware of that. Um, their position from the ground is very vulnerable. And um, I... You know, I think I told you that, like, I've always, the predictions I'm given by social scientists is that in Iraq, for instance, it will be 100 years, given the sliding um, numbers, before Christians are pretty much eradicated. But I was on a call with the Archbishop of Canterbury's team um, a couple weeks ago, and I was interrupted by a bishop from Lebanon who said, you know, that's really optimistic. It's more like 40 years. So... I think this really is a major issue, and um, I'm very, I, I touched on it before, um, during Trump's time, I was at the Council on Foreign Relations here in New York, and I was called down to Washington to, to brief um, Mike Pence, who is evangelical Christian. Um, his team, I just gotten back from doing research, um, field work, actually, for the book. So I gave them a briefing. and. And then I remember I was getting a lot of calls and interest from really right-wing Jewish leaders who um, supported the settler movement. And it finally dawned on me why they were so interested in this, because they could use it as a weapon. You know, they could weaponize 
the eradication of Christians by turning it around and saying, you know, these are radical Muslims. Islam is radical. And I was very, very conscious of that. I have to say it kind of hung over my head as I was writing. Every word. I was really conscious that this book would not be used in that way. Right. It would be used as an anti-Muslim argument yeah. in general. As a weapon, yeah. Um, and so what do you think the answers are? I think it really, okay, so in my view, everything comes down to education, like everything. Um, and I think, first of all, we need to prop up infrastructures. Um, we have to encourage more civil society. We have to train people. I mean, I've just finished a, a really interesting, unfortunately, it was during the pandemic, three-year UN training program where I was training Iraqi, Yemeni, and Syrian truth tellers, um, basically, so that they could report atrocities in their own countries and prepare them, whether they would then go on for war crime tribunals or to be journalists, but they weren't all journalists. Some of them were doctors, some of them ran NGOs. Um, I think it's really important that we we prop them up, whether it's with education, whether it's with economic um, incentives. I mean, Gaza, for instance, I, um, one, I mean, when I was last there in August, I went to see a lot of young entrepreneurs, which is really great because for once I wasn't going from refugee camp to refugee camp. And I did that as well. But I also went to see these young, really bright, thrusting young people that are doing things like starting solar energy um, initiatives or a young woman who started a design collective. But here's the thing. They're leaving. <laughs> they're leaving because it's not safe. Yeah. The May bombing really freaked them out. So they're going to Jordan. They're going wherever they can. We need to we need to we need to help them stay. But that's not Christian specific, is it? No, that's it's not all they're young people. people. No, that's of course, and I said that. But Christian specific. Okay, what can we do? One thing that was really, I thought, a huge, um, very strong message was the Pope um, last spring going to northern Iraq. Um, it was the height of COVID. He's frail. He has health issues. All of his advisors told him not to go. He went. Now, I, I'm a fan of, of Papa Francesco. Many people aren't, but I think he's trying to bring the church into a more modern era. Um, I think he sent a remarkably strong message to the people there and also to their enemies. We're watching, we've got your back. The other thing we could do is policy, I'm talking about US now rather than UK, um, to have some kind of um, military presence there, small but still protective, especially for the, you know, the Christian population that really fear the Iranian-backed militias now and the um, Turkish airstrikes. In Syria, I mean, there's nothing we could do until the war is over. And I I personally believe the war is over and Bashar has won. Um, where that leaves us in terms of justice really troubles me because I'm not sure how a man with that much blood on his hands can ever... <sighs> you know, control a country again? Um, and how will there ever be any kind of compensation for the millions of people that suffered so horribly? Gaza, for the Christian community, um, I think there has to be, the restriction of movement is for them dire, right? So over Christmas, you were talking about Bethlehem, the Israelis were very proud that they gave hundreds of visas to Christians in Gaza to go to Bethlehem, because they like to go there to be with their family. and. Um, but they didn't. They only gave one per family or they divided it up so that they actually couldn't go. Mm -hmm. And the restriction of movement affects all, all Gazans, but Christians trying to get to see their family members and celebrate holidays which are sacred to them, Christmas and Easter. Um, so basically that's it. Policy, mm -hmm. supporting them, education, incentives, trying to encourage them not to migrate, um, rebuilding their churches, which is happening now, um, 
strengthening their communities, uh, allowing them to remain in, in the land of their ancestors. They've been there for 2,000 years. Right, so, right. So it, it, is, it is urgent. Um, well, yeah, a lot of these things, they just do seem like big structural development work that the Middle East really does sorely need. All the young people uh, need that kind of, of, of support in terms of jobs, entrepreneurial um, initiatives, as you mentioned, that, that would go a long way in a lot of countries. Um, but I actually wanted to finish up by going back to what we were talking about at the very start, about how your personal faith involved this project. And I was wondering whether you feel your faith has had an impact on your past reporting as well, particularly in the Middle East, which is, of course, predominantly Muslim. And as a personal example, um, I've interviewed many jihadists. And in my experience, they understand Christians, but they cannot understand or forgive atheists. Like any faith is more comprehensible than none. Do you think your faith has helped you relate to the people you talk to? Maybe in terms that it's made me more empathetic. I mean, the Jes Jesuit values of compassion and empathy but I don't think that that's because I'm Catholic. I think that's who I am. I mean, I, I've worked alongside plenty of reporters, and I'm sure you have too, who see it as a job, a role. They're very pragmatic. They report. They don't really, the, the country or the people doesn't touch them um, or their situations. For me, it was very different. It was always um, more of a, a calling um, mm -hmm. to, to, to document and record um, the atrocities so that no one could ever say it didn't happen and and to also give people agency um you know going as far back as sarajevo you know for people to know what that was like to live for three years without water without heat without electricity um having you know children step outside to build a snowman and get killed by a mortar or the rwandan genocide you know a million people killed so my faith had a lot to do with it in the sense that I felt um, this deep compassion and connection that they that were all essentially, and this sounds super corny, but it really is how I feel that we're, you know, we're, we are all brothers and sisters, and mm -hmm. that, you know, they, it was it was my role to do this, and you know, I live on the Bowery in New York City, um, which is the weirdest place because it's you know you have this tremendous these ugly modern buildings that were built for the rich financiers who live here. So they're closer to wall street, but then you still got the immense homeless problem and the Bowery mission. I live very close to it. So I, you know, I pass these men and women and I always, and this is something my father taught me, you know, I always stop. I always try to talk to them. I always try to go buy them right now. It's freezing. So I go get them like hot drinks and food. I try to take them to a shelter if they don't want to go. I check up on them, but I see people just pass them yeah. every day, you know, and don't even see them or look at them or acknowledge mm -hmm. that they're human beings. And I think my reporting is very much ground in the values that I was given, not just from my faith, from my parents and my parents were devout Catholics. So, you know, but they could have been, they could have been devout Muslims. It's the same thing. It's about charity and compassion and empathy and at the root of all of it, love. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, it's just being human. And has there ever been a time or times in, in your reporting career where your faith has been a problem for you? No, you know, during the um, Balkan Wars, I was very careful. Um, when I was baptized, my I, I got a tiny little crucifix necklace and I used to wear it, but I would always, I always take it off um, when I go, when I report. Um, and I, I have friends that have tattoos, which are, you know, the fish, yeah. um, the sign of Jesus Christ or of crucifix. And I never wanted to get that kind of a tattoo because I, I think that it's really important that you, you remain neutral. But I, um, I think during the Balkan Wars, it was difficult with the Serb Orthodox, who were, of course, were the Christians, um, but they were killing the Bosniaks, the Muslims, and the, they were also killing the Croats and their own people in Sarajevo. But um, that was, that was, 
I mean, while I, you know, I don't want to get into the Balkan War here because it was a very complex thing and it wasn't ethno-national, but also, you know, was it based on religion, victimization, history, lots of stuff. But, um, but no, I maybe there slightly, right. um, but not really, you know, no. I never felt, I never, I've never felt, I was never jihadists or radicals have never said to me, you're a Christian, you're a infidel. That never happened to me. So do you think it changes how you approach stories? Do you think? Well, again, you know, for many years, people would say to me, being a woman, do you report stories in a different way than men? And I would say, but I, it, it's not me being a woman. I would be like this if I was a man. It's the way I am. It's the way I'm built. It's the way I was brought up. It's the way I teach my own son, you know, never look away. And it's just the way I live my life. I feel um, intensely connected to people who are weaker and who need help and whether that is in terms of friendship or helping someone um in a situation when i'm reporting um if i can do it i will i mean that's why we're here on earth otherwise what is the point i just don't get it if people don't understand that but again Lydia, that's, I don't think that's because I'm a woman or I'm Catholic or I'm Italian American or French or British. It's because it's the person I am and it's the person you are. So I think it's a very individual thing, but certainly I can tell you that during my most terrified moments, I have prayed. Um, like the moments when I really thought, okay, this is it. <laughs> you know, I've outdone my nine lives. I'm now in Chechnya and you know, the Russians are encircling the village and I'm, I'm going to be a goner. And it was, it was to my faith that I turned. Right. Right. Well, that comes across very beautifully in your book. Um, so Janine De Giovanni, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. You can buy Janine's book, The Vanishing, Faith, Loss and the Twilight of Christianity in the Land of the Prophets in all good bookshops and follow her on Twitter at Janine DG. This week's podcast was produced by Joshua Martin and hosted by me, Lydia Wilson. You can subscribe to the New Lines magazine podcast on your favourite podcast app. And of course, you can find more of the best stories from the Middle East and beyond on our website, newlinesmag.com. Thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next week.